Hi, this is an interview with Jack Morris, who is a PhD student at Cornell in natural language processing. However, Jack has a really cool blog, and he's written a piece called The Weird and Wonderful World of AI Art, which we're going to discuss today. Now, as I said, Jack is a PhD student in NLP, but for this blog post, he dove into the world of AI art, which is sprawling currently. And we're going to talk about, you know, what happened so far, what are the origins of AI art, at least since the deep learning area, what's currently happening with all the diffusion models and clip combinations and VQ GANs and so on. And we'll also discuss a little bit where it's going in the future. This was a really cool conversation. I certainly learned a lot and I invite you to check it out. Throughout the conversation, we have so many points to jump off of and I'm sure you'll find something that's interesting to you. I'll leave a link to the blog post down in the description. So if you wanna go and read that for yourself, I absolutely invite you to do so. As always, please leave a like if you do, let us know what you think in the comments. And thank you everyone who's sharing out these videos and helping others find my content is really nice. Thanks a lot. I hope you're having fun. Bye. Hi, everyone. Today I'm here with Jack Morris, who is a PhD student at Cornell and works in a research group on NLP, but also writes about all kinds of things on his blog. Among other things, an article that I found really interesting called The Weird and Wonderful World of AI Art that is a description, a little bit of a history, a little bit of a summary and an overview, and a bit of an outlook as well over the current state of art in AI, specifically image generation models and beyond, which I found super fascinating. This is a topic that in recent years uh, has picked up. I, there's almost an improvement every day now in this world. And it's crazy. And I thought it'd be a great opportunity to invite Jack here to talk to us about, you know, what's going on, how these different things work, and maybe also a bit uh, why they work and what the what the sort of accelerators behind that is. So Jack, uh, welcome very much to the channel. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, how did you, we, we were talking just a little bit before we started recording about this. How did you, how did you even get into this? You, you researcher in NLP, which has also seen its own revolution over the last few years. How does someone like you end up in the world of, of AI art in the world of diffusion and clip and whatnot? Yeah, uh, this is a really interesting research area because, uh, it's, it's super new, so most of all the developments are happening online, and uh, it's very distributed in the sense that I think like a lot of the, a lot of the major participants aren't affiliated with like big companies or universities, and so the way I kind of got involved was well, really just seeing the art online, like specifically for me on Twitter, just seeing like some of these images that are generated. This this one on the screen is a pretty good example. Um, that just really challenged my beliefs of like what what neural networks could do. Like, um, I if you had shown me this a year or two ago, I probably wouldn't have believed that it was generated by a neural network. I mean, there there is some really cool computer generated art, like procedural generated stuff, and I mean, there are all sorts of techniques like that. But in terms of just abstract open-ended image generation like these are just qualitatively i think a lot a lot more interesting than the things that that i'd seen before and so anyways i i kind of went down this rabbit hole over this past winter of just looking at the art that a lot of artists were producing and trying to track down the techniques that they were using it was actually pretty hard um like there's there's this sort of like commodity in the form of collab notebooks that people are sharing on Twitter. And there's a, there are a couple hubs, like a few people are, are producing maybe like the most popular, the most interesting ones. And then the collab notebooks get, get forked and there's various versions of them. Um, and they're all changing different things and using different versions of the techniques. But I think I was able to sort of identify like what the most important things were and, uh, what, what most people were using, but it, it took a while. Um, but anyways, to answer your question, I guess I just saw the art on Twitter and I thought it was really cool. 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting. And you, throughout the whole article, you make a point that you have uh, maybe a hypothesis of what spurred these things. And that would be, I if I represent this correctly, multimodal models, uh, the, the, the advent of things like Dali and Clip combining different modalities together uh, really gives an artist control over things. And this kind of brings us a step back into how things were first done initially. Uh, these pictures that you have on here, I remember fondly from my early days in deep learning, which was the sort of yeah deep dream on the left uh, or style transfer in the middle. This was the like this was the non plus deep dream was like the thing, right? It's like, oh, wow, like this is this is it's trippy. It's cool. And it, it kind of gave you an insight into what neural networks are doing. But things have come mm -hmm. a long way, right? Um, can you I don't know when you look at the history of all of these things, what what's the big arch? Well, uh, do you want to just go through the, these three pictures real sure, quick? Yeah. So, so deep dream is, is the thing on the left, um, which is, I, I think based on the idea of finding the input that maximizes some certain like internal thing in the neural network, like in this case, in that picture, I imagine it was something like, like the dog class. And in this case, I'm really not sure what's going on. It's always but... the dog class, right? In image, <laughs> in image net, it's like, it's, it's dog everywhere. Um, right. Yeah, you could, no yeah, you could, you you could excite like a class, you could excite some internal thing. Um, yeah, I remember uh, people were very excited about this. Yeah, it's a, it's a cool idea. Like normally, uh, at least a lot of the supervised learning people do, we, we look at the gradients of the parameters with respect to the input, but Deep Dream is based on the gradient of the, the input, right? And, and actually, instead of changing the parameters of the model, changing changing the input to maximize something, which is which is a cool idea in and of itself. Yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, it is uh, akin to an adversarial example in some way, although I think this is heavily regularized because adversarial examples, usually you don't necessarily see them or they give you some high frequency artifacts. And this, uh, this is very, very different. And people, you know, if, if we talk about art, uh, would this already classify as art like you know what's what what would an artist make of something like deep dream yeah that's a that's a philosophical question i'm not sure i'm qualified to answer that one but uh, some of the some of the pieces produced with deep dream are really interesting and they definitely fall under the realm of sort of like psychedelic uh like trippy artwork but uh some of them are are really cool the the next thing, the next iteration that you have right here are is uh, style transfer uh, networks. Can you just briefly, maybe someone hasn't heard of that. How does a, how, what does style transfer do? How does it work on a very basic level? Um, yeah, yeah, it works by uh, just exploiting the properties of convolutional neural networks to apply sort of like the texture from one image to the content of another. And it, so this case, the content of the image would be like the Mona Lisa. And in the middle one, that the style definitely comes from some Van Gogh, Starry Night type of impressionist painting. Yeah. And and those are really interesting too. I, I, I think there were a bunch of apps that came out that are basically just like letting you do style transfer through an app on your phone, like input two images and it'll copy the style from one onto the content of another. Yes. And, and this was, I mean, it's still, it's still, it is definitely more controllable, let's say than the deep dream one, but it gives you much more predictable results. I think this is more akin to how I would describe like Photoshop or something, right? It's not really, you're producing something, it's you're taking something and then you're kind of changing it, its properties a little bit. You can really imagine I, in Photoshop, I'd have like a Van Gogh filter and I just put it up and it produces something like this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I think that's a, that's a useful distinction. This is more like an image editing technique, or at least it takes two images as an input and outputs one image uh, and a lot of the other things we're looking at take take nothing as an input and output an image or uh 
in, in the case of the stuff we'll get to, take text as an input and output an image. So this is sort of like a stylistic combination of two images and you can only do it with neural network. Um, I, I think Photoshop specifically, you mentioned, has this new, well, they, Adobe's doing all these cool things with of course. this type of research. <laughs> and the newest Photoshops have these like neural filters, which are, which is a new feature that includes a bunch of different things you can apply to images that are based on neural networks. And I think one of the neural filters is is using style transfer. Like basically it's built into Photoshop now, which is cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, it's excellent. I would do the same if I if I were them, right? They 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 um I think the the Adobe suite is like an insane powerhouse, like how much work went into that. Um so then the advent of GANs came. And I remember GANs fondly as well, because that's when I started going to conferences and every single track on every single room and every single workshop was about GANs. Like you could not, it, it is worse than Transformers today. It was just <laughs> everywhere. And uh, at, at initially it wasn't super duper hype, but then they got good. And here we see some, some this person does not exist, which is a very famous website. And I think... There has been everything from this shoe does not exist to this, I don't know, whatever does not exist. Um, but however, again, th these, are, these are now free form produced images, right? But they're very realistic. That is, so we're at the other end of the spectrum. We are not modifying an existing image, but we producing something out of nothing. How, yet, it, they're very much along a data set. Yeah, so this this would be an example of one of the things that takes nothing as an input and just produces an image as the output. And that's probably like at least one of the reasons why GANs were so hyped is just because like these images are so realistic. It's it's somewhat terrifying. I've I've used this as an example to show my friends that aren't as like up to date in AI research and just just to scare them a little bit and show them like the kinds of things that could be done. And this is probably one of the most well-known examples, I think, of like what neural networks can can actually do right now is produce these really realistic human-looking images of people that I, I I think they're sort of like just interpolated versions of all the faces in the in the training data. But there's so many faces in the training data that it it just forms like a totally new face. I I don't think you could like map it back to any individual person. Yeah. And it's usually usually at the ears you can recognize, although here one is hidden, but usually <laughs> kind of the ears would be uh, would be kind of different, the left and right one enough for for uh, you to recognize that it, there's something wrong. But they are uncannily realistic, usually these GAN produced images. So this would be this would be a style GAN V2 probably. Um, and maybe for someone who doesn't know at all how GANs work, there are two networks one is trying to produce images, one is trying to distinguish whether or not a given image is real or fake. And these two, they essentially play a game and they become better. Uh, they sort of level each other up until the, the one that's generating images gets really good at confusing the other one. And in order to do that, it needs to produce realistic images. This is yeah, and GANs would make will make their appearance later on when we talk about things like VQ GAN and so on. But these were the first iterations of really realistic, um, realistic producing images. And you have this interesting thing here, Art Breeder, which I was kind of aware, but there is a story behind this and TikTok. So what what's that about? Oh well, um, wait. Can we can we stay on the GANs for a second? Sure. So. Um, it's not it's not immediately obvious i think why they work so well like there are other models that can generate random images and and some of them work well too um but gans not only have that sort of cool explanation of being the result of two models competing with it with each other um well we can be specific too this is if they're gan generated these are the outputs of the generator network of those two networks and um, there are other networks that generate images, but GANs just tend to do it like really, really well. So the reason why I, inc I include them here 
is because they basically are the state of the art for generating realistic images. Um, so yeah, so the onto Art Breeder. Um, I I think there was just a there was a famous TikTok that that showed generating faces using Art Breeder, um, which is a, another example of AI sort of like making its way into the mainstream with all this stuff. I included it because. Um, like you mentioned, I think the, the main thesis of my article is that by training these multimodal models, we can generate art that's like specific to a level that we were never able to do before. And so starting with GANs, they, they start somewhere random. Like they just start with this random initialization that's a vector of floating point numbers and you have no idea what it means. So you have no idea how to like position it in such a way that it's that it's useful. And so as an artist, um, you could pr probably do two things. One, you could accept your fate, the fact that you have no control over the initialization and just sort of like try to produce things that are that are cool, like either by brute force, just generating a lot of images or by like looking at the output of the GAN and maybe like editing it yourself, like maybe using it for inspiration or a starting point for some artwork. But actually like making changes to the artwork yourself and the second thing you could do is maybe some kind of search like if you if you start with multiple initializations you could examine them all and determine which one maybe has the most value to you or seems the most promising and then do some kind of like recombination of the most interesting initializations kind of like a binary search through the latent space of the GAN and uh, this is this is basically how Art Breeder works. Instead of just generating one image and trying to edit it, or just generating a bunch of images and, and choosing the best one, Art Breeder, Art Breeder has this iterative process where you generate like a few images and you choose the one that you think is best, and then generate more images based on that initial image. And you go through this process step by step in order to sort of like zero in on something that you find interesting. And and this is probably better, but it's probably still not the best way to like coax interesting results out of GANs. Um, there has been like a lot of research into making GANs more controllable. Uh, so the people, people trying to figure out, you know, how can you control the latent space, but we're still not there. I agree with you. Uh, it is quite hard to make these things actually, to control these things and steer these things. Um, I just want to, so a few things to note right here. This is the original paper, uh, just for people who are unaware how far we've come in this domain. Uh, the first outputs of these things, they looked, they looked like, uh, like this. So, so, uh, these were faces that were totally aligned. Uh, so all the eyes are in the same place. All the noses are in the same place. And still that was the output. Uh, even worse, if you look at sort of the image data sets, it was, it was very good at the time, but it was not, um, as you can see, <laughs> it was, there's, there, these, the, uh, the progress is immense. Uh, the other thing for art breeder, uh, I think, uh, just also you, people may not know it's, uh, based on this idea called pick breeder. I don't actually know if this is the original site, um, the original site is by is by uh, certainly Ken Stanley was part of it, where they had also these things creating pictures, and these were not neural networks. These were, I mean, they were they had a, a latent space, but the latent space was quite uh, lower dimensional, and it's kind of a function, a function using trigonometric uh, overlapping functions that produces these images, and then also pig people can sort of recombine images. So it's really cool to see that this comes to the world of neural networks uh, because pick breeder itself has been around for a long time. Um, and yeah, there's, there's, you said there's a famous TikTok on, on how these things are made. Yeah, there's, there's a link if you want to pull it up. Oh, is there? Let's check it out. There's a link to Reddit. Um, and one tick once TikTok ah once TikTok discovered it. Okay. So people people making TikTok about how they art breed. 
I guess that's one way to go viral. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you had you had a you had you have this intermediate post here about the problem with pre-clip art and essentially uh, lacking control. That's the the big deal, right? Uh, the artist can maybe influence stuff a little bit, but not too much, especially if they're not an expert in neural networks. They have no clue except to try it out. Yeah, uh, and you mentioned that there's been a lot of efforts to make GANs like controllable in, in some way or another. And I think uh, that there's some success to that. Like there, I know there's some interfaces where you can like generate faces and adjust, you know, the thickness of the eyebrows and the, the distance between the eyes and things like that. But if, if we just try and think about this from, from first principles, I mean, if what kind of images are we trying to generate? I think the, the goal would be just some kind of like open-ended thing where the model knows about the world and can generate pictures of whatever you want. And given that, what what would the UX look like? Like in the case of faces, maybe they can design this this panel that has knobs and sliders and things where you can readjust how the face looks, but that doesn't apply to everything in the whole world. Um, so at least one guess is just by typing stuff in. I, I think text is, is a really good user interface for this. Um, you can basically be as specific as possible, but you can you can mention anything. And so we come to this idea where we have like a text box and you, you type in the text box what you want to see and the model like generates an image from that. And so everything we're going to talk about after here is some kind of like take on on that paradigm, essentially. There is, yeah, there is the, the paradigm of inputting text and the paradigm of actor critic, essentially an actor critic framework, where usually the way that these things work is that you'd have one model that produces stuff, uh, which could be a GAN, uh, but could also be other image producing models, and then a critic that judges whether it's good or not. Now, interestingly, that it's kind of the same setup as the GAN itself, right? Uh, but the critic right here is going to be clip or any sort of multimodal model where we can control what it does uh, via text. And I, I find it interesting. And instead of, uh, instead of updating the parameters of the model like we would with the GAN, we're going back to the thing we discussed before where we're updating the actual input it itself. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's kind of like, it's sort of a deep dream GAN combination. And so the... <laughs> I guess for that, we have to talk a little bit about Clip. Now, most people have probably heard of Clip, but Clip is essentially a model that takes a piece of text and an image, and it tells you how well they go together, uh, how well the piece of text describes the image, essentially. Now, what we can do is we can simply keep the piece of text fixed and backpropagate through the input uh, in order to figure out the gradient uh, of whatever the input currently is with respect to that text, which essentially means how do we need to change the image in order to make it more compatible to a piece of text. And we hope that if we walk that path uh, many, many steps, then we'll arrive at an image that fits to the text very well, right? Um, and the reason that we need sort of an artist in front of it, which is also interesting, is because if we were to do this just starting from random pixels and then just optimize the pixels, the way neural networks work is we would probably get something quite, um, although I've seen some people do it directly, but we'd probably get a lot of high frequency noise and, and artifacts and so on. And having a GAN in front of it is almost a bit like a, a regularization or a constraint to to make the outputs more let's say believable um yeah what, but i agree that's that's how it could work in principle it's just it's more an artifact of just the tools we have now is that clip is is trained to do this sort of like image caption appraisal but it's not necessarily it, it doesn't have the right parameters to generate images and and people try but it, it's just not that good because of how it's trained but we do have things that are really good at generating images like all the various GANs. And so the artist critic idea is to just sort of like couple them together. And because the whole thing is differentiable, you can use the critic to figure out like how good is the art, 
and then back propagate through the critic and through the artist back to the, the input itself and, and edit the input to maximize the output of the critic. I find it very interesting that now, now obviously you go you go through a bit later uh, through the initial successes of this model um, clip plus clip plus uh, big gan for example where we do exactly that here for example is a prompt that is I don't even know it's like a city I don't know what the prompt was but this picture was very famous because it kind of showed that wow you can actually do something i find it interesting though that the origin story simply came from the fact that OpenAI released this model this blog post here about a model called dali which would actually do it you it was trained to directly produce an image given a piece of text uh, there was no no iterative process no walking gradients nothing it was just input a piece of text and outcomes an image. It was insane. Like the blog post was insane, right? The avocado chair or here the teapot in the shape of an avocado. These are insane. Yet OpenAI just didn't publish the model because I don't know, they're usually their their go-to line is that it's too dangerous or something. Um and had OpenAI released this model, all of the I, I think all of the things that we see in the rest of the blog post would have never happened. I'm pretty convinced. Um, because we just, people were just kind of stoked that we only have the clip model. We didn't have the Dali model. So how can we like get around this? Oh yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Although I, I feel it may have been somewhat inevitable. Like it's not that either Dali or Clip was any sort of major technical breakthrough. But I mean, there's a lot of engineering required and just a lot of monetary resources required to train the models. But I, I don't know how long it would have been before another multimodal model was released that was that was equally good. Um, but, but we can we can talk about Dali for a second. I know you said you made you made a video about it before. Um, People people do produce art with Dolly, and I think some people have a preference for it. Um, it it's basically trained like a language model, is that right? Just with text and then pixels. Yeah, essentially. So here is yeah here is you have a picture of Ru Dolly, which is uh, but trained uh, on the Russian language picture combinations. But yeah, people use this, and it it I feel it it uh it is a bit more representative of maybe the data set that you put in in that it gives a bit more realistic pictures yeah and i think um as an artifact of training it like a language model dolly tends to produce like much more abstract pictures like it's sort of hedging between a bunch of different pictures that could satisfy the caption instead of what gans do which is just sort of like picking one thing and doing it as as best as it can, you know, and so uh, it, it it tends to be very different. And I think in the in the glide paper, which we'll talk about later, they they compare the output of this glide system to Dolly, and they they just say like Dolly tends to produce much more abstract images. I think maybe eighty or ninety percent of the time, as rated by humans. I see, and also the <laughs> the shutter stock. Um... The shutter, right. the shutter stock watermarks are pretty, pretty cool. That's yeah. a data set thing. Yeah, the, <laughs> this is if anyone's listening to this and wants to try it out, the the best open source model right now is this Rue Dolly, I think, it, at least in, in best open source model that does the same thing as Dolly. And they have and a, so a bit of a playground where you can try it out, right? Yeah, but but it is it's trained on like Russian data. So the playground is like you would you import a translation model and then you type t if you're d speaking English or whatever, you have to translate the prompt into Russian. Yeah. So that probably makes it even more uh, abstract. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty cool. Uh, there is also there, there are other really like true, let's say open source um, efforts to replicate this. Uh, one is this Lion 400M data set, which is a, a data set of image text pairs because uh, none of these other models really release their data set. Although I do believe it's not directly by a Luther as you have right here. I don't know how much they are affiliated, but um, it is fully open source. Yeah. 
uh, and there's uh, also okay. there's uh, um, there's also a project called I think Mini Dolly that attempts to to do Dolly in less scale, and I think there are also yeah people who are really trying to to replicate this. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I I linked to Mini Dolly somewhere. I think they're they're scaling it up too. Yeah. So eventually it'll be a large Mini Dolly. Um, and and here with with the advent of this, with the advent of yeah, what was called the big sleep, um, which is this? I I don't even know if is this an an allusion to to deep dream? Uh, does big come from big gan? I don't I don't know. But here we really start this advent of what you described of collab notebooks being passed around, right? And sort of this this art taking off really on Twitter and through Twitter and not anymore through because all the other things there they were kind of conceived in research papers and then people adapted it to things and here uh we entered the realm of people doing just collabs and 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 just kind of sharing them around right yeah yeah um i think this month specifically was a really interesting time like uh, dolly was an open source but clip was and you can you can uh, kind of track how the lineage of all of this through through the tweets like clip was released. And there there were people that were already working on using deep learning to generate art. And some of those people did things like just the most basic thing, the, the deep dream thing, trying to optimize the picture that goes with a certain a certain caption. And the results are like really like really bad looking. Like um but they but they're they're promising like you would see sort of like outlines of things or like little words that were represented representative of the caption and there were people like like day by day iterating on this concept and the first thing that came out i think that was like pretty good was this notebook the big sleep and it got shared around like thousands and thousands of times on twitter and forked a lot and stuff like that and so i think it used big gan is that Yep. Is that right? Big Gan and Clip. Big Gan and Clip, yeah. And um, just that that method of like directly optimizing the input. And so now in 2022, we probably have, we, we maybe would still use Clip, but probably would use something that works a little better than Big Gan and one of these other methods for actually generating the image itself. But even just a few weeks after Clip came out, like you said, it started this whole like, craze on twitter of people working on this and this was like the first the first thing that really worked okay and this so this is by if people wonder this is by ryan murdoch who was one of one of certainly the defining people in the early days of a uh, of this clip plus x models um also interesting here is the the style clip i didn't i didn't even know oh yeah i think i think i saw this somewhere but um, so people would try to use take a style gan uh, and combine it with clip and of just of the nature big gan was sort of trained on ImageNet and larger data sets to produce various different like a variety of images while the style gans would always be kind of constrained to single data sets so it's natural to see that um, you cannot get the style gans to to do as crazy things but it's still pretty crazy what you can get them to do simply by mucking around essentially with their latent spaces. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. That was something that I wanted to mention was some people have this theory that uh, one of the reasons why we have this open-ended generation tool that we didn't have before is because the new models were trained on just like all this data from the web that's just from all over, like a much more rich, diverse data set instead of just you know the 1000 classes from ImageNet. um yeah i mean it it is reasonable it's probably a combination of data set and models and technique but uh, certainly the the data plays plays a, a good and role. scale and scale obviously uh yeah so then a new after after the gans a new contender let's say uh got got released which people i remember were pretty fond of which was the guided diffusion the clip guided diffusion and the pictures of that were also very impressive so what was what is the difference between a gan and a diffusion model as an artist 
Well, they both do kind of the same the same thing in the end, which is that they they produce realistic images given a caption. But it really was important because these this class of models called diffusion models just kind of upset GANs in the race for highest, you know, image generation fidelity. And that that was just coincidentally by other people at OpenAI during last year. But these the, these became like the most powerful powerful models that we had for generating images. But I I might have conflated two things in the in the caption for this section. Yeah, like these diffusion are just models. diffusion models, no. Yeah, yeah, these are just diffusion models. Mm -hmm. And then the process of generating images from a caption, one of the ways to do it with diffusion models is what people call like guided diffusion. And you'll find all sorts of collab notebooks floating around that are helping you generate images using guided diffusion. Mm -hmm. And so just diffusion models, they, they do work by, um, they themselves are an iterative process of producing an image. So they are usually trained by taking real images and applying noise over and over and over again. Uh, so in a stepwise fashion, you destroy the image and then you train a neural network to revert each one of those steps. So to make a little less noisy image from a more noisy image and through some uh, proper through some asymptotic properties you can essentially show that after after destroying an image with so much noise it is a defined distribution and from that you can calculate some bounds and um, then essentially you can revert the whole process using that trained neural network and so we're, we're layering iterative processes on top of iterative processes if we're doing uh, clip guided diffusion but it's fun um, and it makes for very, uh, entertaining image generation. It's very satisfying kind of watching the thing emerge from a blur of noise over some time, but also it's a, it's a problem because it, it makes the process take a very long time. And people, yeah, people, I guess, quickly figured out is that you can just wait for a long time and your quality will get better and better to the point where it could take hours to produce an image like this. Um, yeah, and you get diminishing returns, so mm. it's hard to determine where to stop, especially if it's the artistic process, you know, that we're talking about. So in GPT-3, it was pretty quickly clear that there is something like prompt engineering uh, or even prompt hacking that by prompting the model in a certain way, you could get certain very defined results. And people have caught on to this thing in... Uh, these models as well. Interestingly, with something that's called the Unreal Engine trick. Do you want to elaborate what this was? Yeah, yeah. This is one of my favorite parts of the whole thing um, and relates back to what my my research group works on and all the NLP stuff that people are talking about right now. Um, I, I added this section mostly because of just this whole idea of prompt engineering like really applies to the art generation. In this case, there was a a buzz online where people were showing that if you type in, in this case, maybe the angel of air, which I, I should have done for the blog post, it might generate something like somewhat interesting, but maybe not that specific or realistic. But if you add, if you append unreal engine to the prompt, it'll like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of training data that's generated by this unreal engine thing that includes that in the caption. So clip is smart enough to know what unreal engine looks like. And if you add that into the prompt, it tends to generate images that, that look way better. And I, I don't know, this is a specific style, so maybe it's not for everyone, but just the idea of like asking the model for what you want. Like if you, if you type in a prompt and generate an image, but you think it's too blurry, like type not blurry or yeah, 4K that was like, or... <laughs> that was the most insane thing is like, oh yeah, just type not yeah. blurry. It's like, what? <laughs> Yeah, and, and it works, or or just people just type like beautiful, yeah, and it tends to just make the art look better. And we've we've sort of stacked on this, like people right now they they like write you know uh, pipe, and then they write I, I don't even I don't even know like these art sites VFX and uh, scene on art station and things like this. Mm. And you have the example here of you just append hashtag pixel art, uh, and it will give you pixel art. Yeah, if I'm trying to generate anything realistic, I usually put HD 4K at the end, just just because. And yeah, so there you have a bunch of these. You have a bunch of these 
things right here. These go more back into the, the style transfer type of thing, like we give it a certain style, but I think it's important to note that it really goes as far as just typing like not blurry, and then you get something that's not blurry, which is is crazy. But also these right here, the like German expressionism. <laughs> Yeah, th this specific post is really cool. Um, this person just went through a few dozen artists and generated kind of like the same images, used the same prompts, but appended the names of different artists to the prompt. And they, they look totally different. I, I did something like this myself that I was tweeting about, which was just typing in names of national parks and then generating them but images of them in an impressionist style mm -hmm. and it also worked worked really well and it's, it's a good way to kind of showcase what clip can do because it's this, yeah this is the same that we saw at the beginning right here right this is this is uh kowloon city in the style of wes anderson mm -hmm. but yeah that's that's the thing that excites me the most about all of this is the integration of like world knowledge into the image generation process like to generate this image, the model has to know what Kowloon City looks like uh, and at least sort of the style of a Wes Anderson film. And this is obviously like nothing that you can that you can find online. There's another one that's oh, yeah, this this one on the right here. Can you click on that one? <laughs> it's just cookies made out of kimchi. I don't know if you could ever actually cook them to look like this. <laughs> but th this is probably the best one I have in terms of just showing off like the, the use of real world knowledge and the image generation process. These are really awesome. And the, the prompt was, can you imagine how cool it'd be to have some delicious kimchi cookies right now? Question mark. <laughs> it's also really interesting, right? That you prompt, you really prompt by, by using language now. Not, it's not just keywords, it's actual language. Yeah, that's something I'm trying to improve upon as well. Like I, if I were trying to do this, I probably would have just typed in kimchi cookies. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't always tend to give you the best outputs. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. And I think this, as I said, this is the first time where probably research lags behind uh, the, the, the art production in this case. I think it will be very interesting uh, to pick all of this up and sort of explain all of these phenomena, like why do certain things work better? Why does it work better if we, you know, have a whole story about can you imagine and, and stuff rather than keywords? Uh, super interesting. Can we um, mention this one person that's up here, Catherine Krausen? Yes. Her yeah. Twitter at Rivers Have Wings. She's, if you had to pinpoint one person that's kind of the nexus of this whole movement, it's it's probably her. She's she's done so much. Um, the data set that I mentioned, uh, she helped lead people to collect that. She trains all these different models that are that are useful. She helped come up with this new metric that helps guide the art generation process to be better. She's wrapped almost everything up in a collab notebook and released all these collab notebooks that are useful for people. And uh, I, I guess she she was the first person to combine like diffusion models with clip guidance, which is why I referenced her here. But she's done all sorts of really really awesome stuff. Yes, this is definitely a known name in the in the community. Um, then you you mentioned this glide model right here. Uh, what what makes this different from what came before? they directly trained a model to generate images instead of like using only clip and a, and a model that was separately trained to generate images and they just scaled it up pretty pretty far and and generated some pretty cool stuff i think that the paper didn't do anything new necessarily they also did they used a lot of different techniques from twitter but they, but they cited them all um they actually cited tweets in their paper which i've never seen before <laughs> it's very cool it's a and, weird world yeah 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 um and maybe a collab notebook or maybe they cited a tweet to a collab notebook can't remember which mm. and these examples are are from the glide model so it's it's basically just trained to optimize the same thing that we're talking about already which is like the glide model does both the the role of the artist and the critic at the same time. Mm -hmm. 
and yeah you can you can given that it's a, a diffusion model you can do a lot of different things from it such as conditional generation only generate parts of the image uh and so on so that was that's also a very very neat property of these diffusion models uh only changing the yeah. hair or only like changing the the particular parts of the room all right so the top right one is is so 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 the green mask is the area that's actually allowed to be optimized i think this this task is called like image in painting it's kind of just like post text guided post hoc image editing and is it possible for you to like zoom in on the top right image so the the mask is is over the dog so the optimization process is only editing the pixels that are within that green mask and this is a famous painting that has like a king charles spaniel and then they just typed a girl hugging a corgi on a pedestal and then optimized it until the glide model thought that the painting matched that caption as best as possible and it pretty much just like realistically substituted the the spaniel for the corgi which is so awesome and i i guarantee you this will make its way into photoshop yes i, I just thought later. yeah i just thought of saying this like this is gonna be can you imagine just having this just painting a bit of a mask typing in a piece of text and then uh out comes what you want this is going to i think yeah i, th I think it's it's going to revolutionize uh, maybe not art itself, but certainly the way we interact with with pictures as such. Crazy. At least clip art generation. It would yeah. be nice every time you make a set of slides to just generate some unique little art pieces for your slides. Yes. Um, so we've we've reached the conclusion of your article right here, but the story is not over. As we said, uh, things are coming out almost every day, and one of the interesting things that has come out in the last i think weeks or months uh is this transition also into video content and specifically there is this um there is this technique called disco diffusion do you know that yeah what um, is that disco diffusion is is the, well it's actually the name of a of a collab notebook Okay. So maybe if you type disco diffusion collab. Oh, I actually have a link to it at the bottom of my article, I think. Okay, okay. Right. But there there are different people trying to use these techniques to generate videos. Um, I yeah. think the most common, well, probably the most common oh, so thing. So disco isn't see. video itself. Disco, but you can then make a video of it or. Yeah, disco diffusion is, is just the name of a, of a collab notebook that generates okay. images from prompts. But yeah. it includes, I, in some versions, tools for kind of like interpolating through the latent space from one prompt to another. And so the the video is like taking, I, I think, a linear path from the image produced, the latent space representation of the image for one prompt to the latent representation of an image for another prompt. And it it tends to produce like these crazy videos, but it's totally continuous because you're taking like a, like a continuous path through the latent space. So they're very, very cool. Insane. Yeah, this is a bit how I, I, I don't know if you've seen this, but I've made this music video and I did kind of the same thing in, but obviously much more primitive. Uh, these things are, these things are crazy uh, in, in how good they are. There are a number of Twitter accounts that people can follow and i think you link a lot of them in at the end of your article and you also link a lot of the uh of the notebooks of the collabs that do this now also in le recent times i've observed at the beginning i've observed i could find most of the collabs people would just kind of post them on twitter um then th there was some collabs where it was like you know you have to be like my my patreon in order to get the newest collab which i i thought it was what you know that's obviously cool because there's a lot of work going into them. But recently I found, is it people want to sell NFTs of their stuff and that's why they don't give out the collabs anymore or what's happened? Like I've had a lot of trouble finding stuff uh, recently. Yeah, the, I, I'm not sure about the connection between the, the <laughs> NFT generation and, and collab, but that is a big source of the excitement for this kind of thing. I kind of stayed away from that for my article. I think I might have one example of an art piece that I thought was particularly 
compelling that was minted as an NFT, but there, there are various collections that are kind of like this, where it's like, you just, you click the mint button and a new piece of art is created and it's an NFT and it uses these techniques behind the scenes. And I think Catherine Krausen has her own line of NFTs. If, if I were someone who purchased NFTs, I would pr- probably buy one of hers. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's just uh, but it's just weird or is is this a wrong impression of me that the collabs have become harder that people aren't sharing as much anymore oh definitely and, and everyone seems to have their own post-processing steps um i haven't really talked about that but most of the stuff that i share is directly generated through the clip guided diffusion process or something like it but a lot of like the really good, especially really high definition art has all sorts of steps besides just the art generation. Like they might upsample or upscale it using another GAN or use another GAN that takes art and produces new art that's supposed to be better than the first art that it saw. And plus all sorts of regular, you know, photo post-processing, like changing the saturation or editing all, all the different things you might edit. So well, just I, just just a note to to myself editing later uh, that we were gonna have to censor this one. Just <laughs> just saying, mm. <laughs> there are body parts in that one that are not okay for YouTube. <laughs> Good call. Um, yeah, I probably would have would have found you for that. Um. Yeah. Sorry. You, sorry. I interrupted. Oh yeah. So so people have their own kind of like personal stacks for art generation usually starting with some kind of art artist critic thing that outputs Mm. an image but then they do all sorts of stuff to it after and people can be pretty hesitant to share i think their personal art generation processes yeah it's it's interesting because at the beginning you could really feel it was more like a community together tries to figure out what's the best thing to produce art and now that it kind of is uh and it's almost an established field right it's more about it's more about you know i have my little secret thing and i can you know produce uh very cool things and i don't want anyone else to be able to do that and it's interesting do you do you you've also uh we we talked about there being and i've pulled this up right here this was the first ai generated portrait ever sold at an auction it was sold by Jeez, a giant amount of money. Um, is this a thing still? Like, are these things you said there's like an NFT collection? Is this a big market AI generated art? Well, our art is very subjective, and I think a lot of the times, uh, the a lot of the value comes from who created the art. And I think in this case, it was like a pretty well-known group of artists that generated art with computers and they made a piece that was generated with AI. Um, I'm not sure if if maybe your concrete question was something like, has anyone sold a physical painting like this that's been generated with clip? And I haven't heard of that happening. I think that part of that might be because it's just so accessible and easy to generate this type of art right now. It, It kind of cheapens it in as a commodity and uh i i I don't know i'd be interested to see like what what are the the most valuable pieces of artwork that have been generated with clip we could probably look that up in terms of nfts but it might not correlate that well with you know artistic value what where do you see this going in the in the future like um Right now, I can type in, yeah, a bit of piece of text and so on. Are the future artists more going to be computer scientists that figure out better post-processing and so on? Or how can this really help? I feel feel that this is still not enough controllability for an artist to type in a piece of text and see what comes out. I feel that the artists, they still don't really actually think that they're in control of what's happening or that this is just a tool. Uh, where do you see this going in the future, uh, especially in terms of in terms of you know how it interacts with art and artists? Yeah, I, it's a really exciting time, and you know it's impossible to predict the future. I feel like we can definitely agree that something very important 
exists now that did not exist before. Um, it, it's hard to say like what kinds of innovations that'll directly lead to. I, I agree that the prompting process is pretty cumbersome. I mean, the images are, are too slow to generate and uh, you can you can type something in the prompt and you won't always see it in the output, which is which is a big problem. I think that the people that that share art on Twitter generally have some sort of process that resembles the art breeder thing we looked at, where that would be something like you type in a prompt and then instead of just generating one output, you generate four or 64 and then you pick the one that's most interesting to you and work with that, either like generating things that are similar to it or just upscaling it and, and choosing like higher resolution versions that you like better. I think um, Catherine Krausen has shared some like art exploration she does where she generates like this uh, maybe 32 by 32 matrix of images that all that all fit a prompt. And I think that's really, really compelling too, just to show how how cheap that this makes the art generation process. Like she'll type something in and and they'll all look, you know, pretty decent, which is which is crazy. So so I think people will definitely not just be typing something in and producing a single piece of artwork. I can probably guarantee that. Yeah. But maybe the the mechanical aspect of producing art, sort of the the going and, and modifying the either pixels or, or yeah, brush strokes themselves are maybe a little bit more receding and maybe the sort of coming up, interacting with these models in some way or, or selecting things that one likes uh, are maybe a bit more in the foreground in the future. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And maybe it'll make art more more accessible to people like there there's kind of two skills maybe you could break art down into one being actually mechanically creating it and the other being like appraising it and deciding whether it's good or not that's kind of just like the the artist critic paradigm but maybe this would uh, enable people to create art that have a good eye for things but didn't have you know the dexterity or whatever paintbrush skills they needed to create the art that they wanted to beforehand that, that's an exciting possibility cool anything else you oh wait here is elon musk experiencing pain we gotta look at this ah ah that's terrible, <laughs> <laughs> that terrible. anything else you you want to get you want to um get uh anything else you'd like people to know about this stuff um well, I think some of the examples that I shared were generated with the large glide model, which is not open source yet. And that is kind of a shame. I think it'll, I, I'm sure they have good reasons for not sharing it, but hopefully within the year or so, there will be an equally large, equally capable model because glide is significant because it, it the, I think the the generations from glide will be less abstract than the ones we see now. Um, which will be good if you just want to type, I don't know, so if, if you want to visualize something that doesn't exist that the model could create for you, like in these outputs, that that's kind of like a separate thing that's closer to what I was saying about clip art generation. But um, that just the ones that are out right now just don't don't work particularly well. And you could still um, get abstract stuff by typing abstract stuff like here, like a surrealist <laughs> dream, like oil painting. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, yeah, but I think the rest of this stuff is open source. So if anyone pulls up my blog post after watching this, I encourage you to just scroll down to the collab part and open one of them up and try, try running it. It's free. Yeah. And there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of references and links to all kinds of stuff here. So I definitely invite people to check out the, the blog post again. It's called the weird and wonderful world of AI art. And I'll certainly link to it in the description of this video. All right, Jack Morris, thank you very much for being with us and explaining this to us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Cool.